Welcome to DC Thursday, everyone. I'm Pete Soderling. I'm the founder of Data Council and the Data Community Fund. And as you know, every other week or so, I'm your guide through the sprawling, expanding, massive, changing, shifting, evolving, oh, I said it already, data ecosystem. Uh, so we bring you great guests who are in our community and have contributed significantly to um, either open source projects or company building, uh, sometimes both. And I'm here today with Neha Pawar, who is from Startree, and she's a core contributor to the Apache Pino project. So we'll be talking to Neha about a variety of things uh, that have sort of developed in the, in the Pino community over the last couple of years. Um, we had Kishore, the, one of the other contributors to Pino uh, at, our, at our conference in 2019, um, which kicked off the relationship. And then we had him back on DC Thursday in 2020. So excited to have Neha here today, um, who's gonna give us an update on a lot of developments in the Pino project since then. So I wanna officially um, introduce Neha. She's a founding engineer at Startree. She's also an Apache Pino PMC member. She was formerly a software engineer at LinkedIn and Yahoo, and she has a master's in computer science from the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign, where Mark Andreessen went. So um, Neha, you uh, have some great experience and, and great credentials, and we're excited to talk to you and have you on the show today. Thanks, Pete. That was a great introduction. I am super excited to be here as well. I'm a big fan of the show and super pumped to be uh, here as a guest today. Oh, great. Thank you for the kind words. So Neha, I, I want to start where we usually start with folks, and I want to understand how you got into data and uh, what the origin story is uh, for you. Uh, so for me, the fascination with data actually started in uh, grad school. The data scene in my school was uh, quite buzzing, and I always found myself picking uh, very interesting data-related problems to solve even then, uh, be it adding some indexing in a MapReduce job to make it faster or uh, analyzing a Twitter stream in real time to find which uh, venues or restaurants have some buzzing events happening uh, today. So those kind of projects. And then after grad school, I had the wonderful opportunity to work at LinkedIn in the data infra org. So uh, many cool data and streaming info projects were happening in LinkedIn at that time, like Kafka, Samza, Goblin, Pino, Voldemort. Mm -hmm. So I got to see the whole ecosystem involved uh, from the birth of an event to the transformations, to the storage, to the analytics, the management, the purging, just all of it. And that basically just got me excited and kept me in data since then. Great. And you worked with some amazing folks um, there at LinkedIn with uh, Shashanka. Um, you probably worked with BG, if I'm not, not mistaken. Um, who, who else did you work with? Uh, Jay Krebs, probably, um, during that time. Uh, so Shashanka, definitely uh, not with Jay Krebs. I joined probably a little later than... Oh, just uh, after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and... That's where I met all the wonderful folks of the Pino uh, founding team, Kishore and Sean, mm -hmm. and, uh, the same folks who I work with closely now in Startree. Great, awesome. Well, um, when you talk about the origin of Pino at LinkedIn, I've heard this about this Third Eye project. Um, can you tell us about Third Eye and, and what that project was and how it was sort of connected to the inception of Pino? Yes. Uh, so. When I joined LinkedIn, I uh, started working actually on the Third Eye project first. And uh, Third Eye was this, or is still, uh, still a very popular in LinkedIn and also gaining adoption outside now. This root cause analysis and anomaly detection tool uh, that was built on top of Pino. And this helped make monitoring of business metrics uh, real time and automatic, and also aided in the investigation of uh, anomalies that you found in business metrics. So to give you an example, uh, there were these key business metrics that were very important to all the execs in LinkedIn. And uh, periodically this uh, report got generated like on an hourly fashion and was sent to all uh, the people. And then they used to look at the dashboards and then uh, 
see that oh some metric is down or some metric is uh, different compared to how it was last week and then they used to ask questions that hey uh, why is this metric uh, behaving differently and then there was a team of operators and whose job was to figure out what was wrong with the metrics and uh, it often took them several hours there was this time when it took them like a couple of days to figure out like what was wrong uh so with third eye uh this time to get from anomaly or rather to detect anomaly and then find the root cause was uh reduced quite a lot so the anomaly detection was automatic the investigation was much easier because there were these rich uh, visualizations like a lot of time series and then uh, some heat maps where you could see every dimension every value within the dimension mm. in one view mm. uh, and then you could um, slice and dice into them with like super low latency and then um, not just that this this is kind of still a manual investigation and then you still kind of have to figure out what the root cause was so for that third eye helped with uh, you could plug in more data sources for example at linkedin we had plugged in holiday events or mm. uh, deployment events or mm -hmm. any experiments that are going on in linkedin so kind of see all of them around the timeline of the anomaly together to help you make the best guess of what uh, could be the root cause of the anomalous behavior and Got this it. used to happen uh, super fast on the third eye application at that time because it was built on top of pino mm -hmm. and that was kind mm. of how third eye was born Got and it. how it helped make pino even faster wow yeah. so is that is that to say that the dashboards themselves were also um consuming pino data yes yes yeah. so all the data that was being analyzed was being mm -hmm. put into pino tables mm -hmm. and then everything that was rendered and uh, all the anomaly pipelines that were running mm. everything was just powered by pino so so you were probably um one of the companies leading the charge in real time data consumption even from a bi standpoint um i imagine like lots of folks that consume bi data um don't necessarily have access to real time fresh data and probably their even their management teams aren't necessarily tooled to appreciate how they would use real time data at the at the bi level um, so that sounds like it was quite a forward looking thing from linkedin even in 2012 yes that's exactly right so even for the dashboarding we we were very spoiled and used to just having real time mm -hmm. data and uh, low latency queries right from mm -hmm. many years ago yeah got it so when it came to um discovering the anomalous behavior i suppose um before third eye there could have been some question if if some executive saw a metric drop um probably the first question that sort of came back or the engineers would ask themselves when faced with that predicament was well like obviously why did it drop but um it could have been due to some data quality issue and not necessarily an actual material change in the metric itself um i i assume so that's probably one of the early things that you built third eye to figure out uh Yes, so one of the things that people had to figure out at that time was uh, data quality. Definitely, what ended up happening is we had all this data in data lake, like in Hadoop, and then we had to run batch jobs to figure out that uh, sometimes that hey, we need to find out this other metrics behavior based on this, or we need more information. So it was a very slow process and. uh um, just correlating a lot of other events uh like the deployments or like mm -hmm. uh experiments also kind of helped us catch all these data quality issues or mm -hmm. find out that some pipelines have not run so mm -hmm. all those things mm. that's great so i i guess i wasn't entirely familiar with the complexity of that use case but it's amazing that you could uh, suck in signal from many other types of sources and actually use it to augment your anomaly signals uh, in that way. Um so then after that use case I think the 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 other use case that Kishore talks about is well Pino is used to um show all the metrics on 
who's visited your profile or how many people have like visited you and all of sort of those internal aggregations that the LinkedIn product displays to end users um, that show how popular they are or, or, you know, or that, that type of data. Um, but that was actually a use case that came after third eye. Uh, so I would say it was a little before or kind of about okay. the same time okay. uh, that both of these things were happening. Uh, I see. And this this was one of the very cool things that I uh, learned at LinkedIn or that I saw at LinkedIn that uh, everyone was always trying to stay ahead of the game and set the trend instead of catch the trend and then mm. get on it later on. So showing the profile views on uh, the Who Viewed My Profile app and then giving the users the ability to slice and dice on it, uh, like just opening it up to the users and saying that, hey, you can go slice and dice on it by country or job title. This is uh, user-facing analytics. It was uh, like a very new category at that time and mm -hmm. it's still a very new uncharted category for many companies. Uh, and even like a few years ago, this was like seven or eight years ago, uh, from then itself, this was being done at LinkedIn, which was like a really cool thing. So there was always this uh, urge to stay ahead, think ahead that, hey, no, internal ana analytics is not good enough. We need to, we need real time. We need systems like Pino or batch is not good enough. We need to make the anomaly detection real time. We have to get away from just like a report being sent to users. So this was like, very cool engineering culture at LinkedIn. Got it. Awesome. Um, and so I think, you know, listeners can probably um, decode like the, the gist of what Pino is about. But if you had to say it in one sentence, um, how would you describe Pino? Uh, if I had to say it in one sentence, it would be uh, Pino is an OLAP data store. So specializing in analytical workloads mm -hmm. that gives you ultra low latency, high throughput analytics, uh, which helps you enter the new breed of real time user facing analytics and mm -hmm. lets you unlock challenging and interesting use cases that will help take your business to the next level. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Um, and so let's, talk, let, let's just do a quick refresher um, for folks who might not be intimately familiar with the project. Um, can you talk to us about the main architectural components of the system? Uh, yes. So from the architecture perspective, there are just three main components. Uh, the first main component is the Pino servers. So this is kind of like the storage layer, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, this is These are the components that will host the data in the form of segments. Uh, segments are just portions of the data packed in columnar fashion along with uh, indexes and dictionaries. Then we have the next component on top of the servers is the, is the query serving layer. It's the Pinot brokers. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that will uh, take the queries from clients, scatter them to the servers, gather the results, merge them, and then send them back. And then finally, we have the controllers that are uh, with the help of uh, Apache Helix, manage the whole state of the cluster. And then any instance that comes up in Pino gets one or more of these roles. Uh, when you're just getting started, you can just have a single instance that takes up all these roles. And then as you move into more production settings, you can start separating the roles. And then at any of these layers, you can independently uh, scale them horizontally mm. or vertically. Uh, yeah, so this would be kind of a quick summary of the architecture. Got it. Okay, makes sense. Um, and what about the what about the ingest layer? I guess the the in, the the data ingest is sort of a a separate tool that's used to get data into into Pino. So that's not a that's not a process um, in the system or a piece of the architecture. Uh, so yes and no. Uh, that's mm. like a, a really good question. So. Pino can ingest from uh, real-time streaming systems like Kafka, Kinesis, or uh, Pulsar, PubSub, and that happens natively. 
uh, you don't need any other components. So the server, the Pinot server's okay. layer, that's the layer that has the ability to directly talk to the streaming systems and uh, ingest data. They, uh, the servers do their own um, offset management, checkpointing to make sure that the consumption is exactly once and that uh, and that it's like it keeps going continuously. It's fault tolerant. But if you have data in, say, a data lake somewhere, and then you need to do some batch ingestion uh, periodically into Pinot, in that case, uh, you did need like an external system. Say you had to write a MapReduce job or a Spark job. So you had to bring up those clusters and then uh, periodically, say, create a Pinot segment and push it into the Pinot cluster. Mm. Uh, but now we have uh, a new component, uh, not so new anymore, but still uh, sort of uh, unpopular yet uh, that I did not bring up in the architecture. It's called the Pinot Minion. Okay. And this component has been built to uh, offload computationally intensive tasks from uh, other components. And the second reason it was built is to uh, help Pinot take in more uh, activities that were not happening natively and then just bring them into Pino. I see. So ingestion is one of those. Uh, so we have uh, the minions. They are able to uh, take Pino from a push-based model where users had to kind of generate the segments, maintain those external systems and push the segments to Pino. The minions are uh, allowing us to go from that to a pull-based model, like in the streaming systems. So we simply, uh, just like in streaming ingestion, simply point to the source, the data lake in this case, and uh, the minions are just able to ingest the data, build the segments, push it into the Pinot cluster, uh, keep doing this incrementally, also uh, keep the source and the segments in sync. Uh, so yes, with this, uh, with this, it's becoming more and more native to do batch ingestion in Pinot itself and okay. free the users from all those external systems. I see. So I saw that in your product demo, um, you have this notion of a data manager. And so the data manager must be supporting or supported by both the minions and the ingest um, on the on the server side, I, I assume it's sort of a logical representation of, of pieces of both of those things. Is that right? Yes, that's a very accurate observation. Uh, so, data manager is actually in Startree. It's not in Apache Pino. I see. Uh huh. Um, but the streaming ingestion and some of the minion ingestion pieces are in open source. Mm -hmm. In Startree, we've kind of built on top of these to add, say, a lot more connectors. Uh, for example, we have a Snowflake connector. Uh, so if you have data in data warehouses, Snowflake or BigQuery or any other SQL based data system, in open source Pino, you would have to write some ETL jobs to get that data into a data lake or put it into Kafka in some form that uh, Pino is able to natively ingest from. Uh, but we kind of added more connectors there to just natively ingest even from that. And then data set manager, as you rightly pointed out, is uh, on top of all of this. So it's just, mm. it will let you ingest no matter where your data is. And mm -hmm. ingestion for the user should just be a few clicks. Uh, it should just be a matter of, hey, tell yours where my data is at. Uh, and then Pino figures out the rest mm -hmm. get, and helping us uh, get uh, get past all those external systems and writing the pipelines and mm -hmm. monitoring those. And then it will be able to do it, whether it's like a streaming system or a data warehouse or a SQL based data source or data in a data lake and so on. Okay. Well, um, since, since we're on the topic, um, I do want to ask a question about the ingest. We can move on to talk more about the community and, and some of the other things after that. But um, I did notice that in the data manager, there's this notion of um, sort of validating the input schema, but then also translating it into a Pinot schema, which may be different, or you may, you may make some decisions to yeah. optimize the data 
for Pinot storage. Um, I was just curious as to how that process works and, and why that is. Um, can you talk about any of that schema inference piece of it? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, so, uh, so you're right when there's this uh, schema to your source data and what you might actually want in your Pinot table, uh, it can be pretty different. And the motivation behind adding the schema inference and also table config inference uh, into dataset manager is that uh, we shouldn't put the burden on the user that, hey, Pinot needs a schema, Pinot needs a table config with these, these, these things set in there. Uh, from the user's perspective, it should be as simple as uh, here's my Kafka topic or here's the S3 bucket where I have my data and then just like figure it out. Uh, and then we take that, read a few, like read, read some sample data and come up with, hey, here's what we think your schema should be. Here's what we think the indexing should be for your mm -hmm. uh, columns. Mm -hmm. This is how we think you should uh, structure some of the uh, unstructured or the semi-structured or the nested fields so that you can query them better. Uh, and then of course we give the user an ability to step in at any stage of that inference and say, uh, oh, here's an extra column that I want. That's maybe a derived column, or maybe mm -hmm. I don't care about this column, or uh, I know that my query characteristics are going to be different for this based on my use case. So here's some extra index that I want to add. Mm -hmm. But for the very base case, uh, it should just be, hey, everything's figured out for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciated that in, in seeing how the Star Tree tool is set up that you're really focusing on simplicity and ease of use and um, you know, trying to present user with smart defaults that they could just click through um, if they wanted to, but there's also some power where they could um, manipulate those configuration values throughout the ingest process as well, or add um, computed columns um, or sort of alternate um, data definitions um, that might be more, more meaningful to them. Um, so yeah. I found that, that to be quite powerful. Well, um, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the, the Pinot community and how that's evolved, because uh, I know you've seen a lot of growth in the community and um, and I, I feel like um, as per any, you know, well-run open source project, you've allowed the community to, to sort of help you determine where to go next. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask you um, just at a high level, how would you say um, Pino is, is different now than what it was um, in sort of its first, when, when it was first envisioned at LinkedIn? Are there, are there like many significant things or a few significant things? How would you sort of describe the difference as to where we are today and just the state of the union with Pino, Pino in general? Uh, so I would say that the core components and the core principles are still very much the same, uh, but on a very high level, Pino today compared to a few years ago is just a lot more holistic and extensible than it used mm. to be. Um, so and so this mainly happened because while like Uber and LinkedIn success stories, like they were awesome and the adoption and the use cases done there, they were like really amazing. But these companies were uh, companies with like mature data orgs. There were teams to handle deployments, mm -hmm. operations, ingestion. There was not a lot of variability in what was the source of your events or where what you would use as your data lake. Right. Uh, but then out in the wild, it was uh, a very different story. There was like less control, more diversity in the sources and the visualization layer and all that. Um, so that kind of helped to drive this change from it being uh, just integrated with a few things to now very extensible and very easy to plug in other things and just more uh, more open to, mm -hmm. to more opinions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, and we'll talk about this a bit, um, it's the growth of that connector ecosystem. I know that you see as kind of a sign of the, the maturity of the product and uh, the project and the ability to embrace 
um, different types of, of data um, sort of wherever it lives uh, on the customer side? Uh, yes, so the connector ecosystem, the growth of that and just the number of amazing contributions we're getting to that is uh, definitely like a great sign that we're seeing that uh, the community is involved in helping us shape things. Uh, and it was uh, not just the connectors, right? There was like some more gaps that we kind of uh, identified and like kind of fixed that mm. helped just shape uh, and fuel the com community even more. So for example, uh, like a couple of years ago when, uh, this is around a time when a few of us got together and uh, at Startree, we kind of really took a deep look into the problems that were being faced by the community and just really thought, hey, how can we help the community succeed? Uh, so one thing that was uh, very evident at that time was that Pino is like this very uh, good production quality system, but the it was not very developer friendly. So the getting started experience was not quite there. So we had to make sure that it's very easy for somebody to just come in, uh, be able to seamlessly run the quick start and uh, just be able to get started and then slowly, slowly figure out all the amazing configurations that are there to do more mm. and more. Mm. Uh, LinkedIn and Uber both started off as on-prem deployments. So we had to make sure that we make it a cloud native at Kubernetes deployment support. Uh, and then definitely all the uh, connectors. So for that, we had to make sure that just because we want to add a lot of connectors uh, doesn't mean every time you have to go and duplicate a lot of code or understand how the core engine is working. So making sure that the architecture is very pluggable and with just minimum uh, implementations of like a clean interface, you're able to get to a new connector. And when we did that, we got just uh, amazing contributions like the Kinesis connector, the Pulsar connector, all mm. from the community mm. and uh, some very interesting integrations like uh, there's now a Pino Flink sync to just put data directly from Flink into Pino. There's like this cool recipe of how to get data from Debezium into Pino. Mm -hmm. um, there's like more integrations on the visualization layer. So Superset and Tableau and all this, uh, all this goodness was coming to us. All these uh, inputs were coming to us from the community, which mm -hmm. was really great. That's great. Um, and did you have a sense that there were so many companies out there using Pino before this, or was this sort of a aha moment to you when you realized how uh, widespread the interest and adoption of Pino potentially was? Or did you have other metrics prior that showed you this? Uh, so I would say prior to maybe 2020, we did not uh, mm. have any real metrics that we were tracking to know this. We just knew that there was uh, LinkedIn, Uber, and like a couple of other companies. And then after that, we were, uh, we really started keeping a track of this, like the number of Docker downloads or uh, the activity in our Slack channels and just the participation in our meetups. Or we used to do this uh, survey to decide what we should do in the next few months in Pino. And we used to send it to the Pino Slack channel. And then we used to get amazing participation on it, on like voting on the features that we thought uh, we should do or some new ideas. Uh, that's kind of when we started realizing that, hey, mm. the adoption is like really growing. Uh, we went from some hundred members in the Slack channel in early 2020 to uh, almost 3000, like in the late 2000s of number mm -hmm. of members in mm -hmm. the Slack today. It's one of the most active Slack communities that I've seen uh, and adoptions have been there from uh, very different use cases as well now, different sectors. So we have uh, FinTech, we have Stripe and WePay, we have uh, Target and Walmart in uh, retail. We have uh, Cisco doing WebEx analytics. We're doing, mm. a, they're doing a meetup for the Pino community next week, actually. Oh, great. Yeah, so this, uh, that's when we kind of started realizing that, hey, this is, uh, this is picking up a lot of steam now. Very cool, that's great to hear.
Um, one of the benefits of running an open source project that's successful is you, you start to get these contributions, pull requests, new features, and also sort of examples of, of you know, essentially customers, um, not paying customers, but open source customers who are using the tool in different configurations. So I'm sure harnessing the power of all that feedback is very useful to the future direction of the, the product. The yeah, project. definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, so, well, th thanks for sort of catching us up on, on some of the growth of the community. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, how has Pino adopted or adapted, I should say, to um, current trends in, in the data world? Um, I know that you've made some other improvements to Pino, and I'm curious to hear about them as well. Uh, yes, uh, this, this is a great question. So. Uh, so one of the trends that uh, we were seeing as we were working on Pino last few years is the shift from uh, highly structured data to semi-structured or uh, unstructured data. Mm -hmm. And uh, like a few years ago, it was, so the data set manager is also kind of one of the tools that's uh, helping with those trends, mm -hmm. uh, but even natively in Pino, there's uh, some like several features that we did to make this uh, easier. Uh, for example, we've added a lot of uh, transformations that can happen on the fly during ingestion. Uh, and this kind of further helps remove the need for external systems where you have to do pre-processing workflows for common scenarios such as filtering or adding derived columns or just flattening your uh, nested fields. So we added like a lot of uh, uh, transform functions in Pino natively for doing just basic uh, column manipulations. And then we also have a way to write uh, groovy scripts for like a very custom transform logic. Mm. And uh, to go back to the pluggability point, it's very easy for you to just add your own transform function uh, as a UDF, annotate it with one pre-decided uh, keyword, and then just drop it in uh, your deployment and you will just be able to use it. And, and that becomes uh, its own its own column then. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this, it becomes its own UDF and then you can use that in mm. your, uh, when you're setting up your table to say that, hey, this column is going to use this UDF I see. Mm -hmm. get this whole new value. Mm -hmm. And then the other cool thing to uh, help with this whole semi-structured, unstructured uh, shift was that we uh, are now natively able to just ingest, uh, say, nested JSON or arbitrary complex JSON or just complex data structures. And once it is in Pino, we have added this cool index called JSON index that lets you, so it's going to go and index every field in your complex arbitrary mm. blob, no matter mm. what it is. And you will be able to reap the same low latency query performance of your complex JSON blob as if it were a column that was uh, thought oh. of and pre-processed and uh, put something that you would have put a proper index on. So you can just say, hey, here's my JSON column. I'm setting a JSON index on it and you're good to go. Wow, that sounds like black magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of our benchmarks have shown some uh, amazing improvement when we use a uh, JSON index on a column versus just having to read it and then parse it and then do mm. some manipulation to extract something. So almost like going from tens of seconds to a few milliseconds because of adding JSON index. Mm. That's that's super interesting. Um, well, on the index point, because I wanted to ask you about this, I've noticed that Pino supports so many different kinds of indexes on, on columns, which is like amazing. Um, can you talk about some of the most popular ones? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, on the same lines as JSON index in the, to help with this semi-structured, unstructured data, we also have a text index. Uh, this is, so you can just in, add a text index on say a very large text blob, and then you can do phrase, prefix, regex based, text search queries. Mm. Uh, and then we have uh, geospatial indexes. So if you have coordinates, then you can just use natively a geospatial index to run geospatial queries. 
uh, this was uh, actually a great contribution by uh, Uber folks again. And um, mm. they built one very interesting feature called Orders Near You in Uber Eats. Okay. Uh, that uses this index uh, mm -hmm. behind the scenes. So when you kind of open your Uber app, you'll see in real time the orders that are happening near you. Wow. So all in real time. Like the, so you can, eat, you can eat what your neighbor's eating. Yeah. And you can see what's <laughs> popular in the area, which restaurant uh, is uh -huh. kind of, which restaurant has the most orders today and mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm. something special. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so these three kind of help a lot with just... Uh, log analytics, text search, or building mm. special dashboards and mm. that are uh, special dashboards for personalization or user-facing analytics, like Uber Eats example. Some of the other cool indexes would be, uh, so we started off with the forward index, inverted index, the sorted index, the very basic mm -hmm. ones. Then we added range indexes, which are for uh, range queries. So Typically, if you have something like greater than this time, less than this time, mm -hmm. then this index will uh, make it much faster than using a traditional inverted index or a sorted mm -hmm. index. And then uh, we also have uh, the start re-index, uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, of course, how the company start re gets its name from. And uh, this one is a very cool index. Uh, so. This one is kind of going to help you. So think of this extreme two, use, two ends of a spectrum where you have your data and you could either choose to not pre-aggregate anything at all, just keep uh, everything unpre-aggregated. And then when you get a query, that is when you will go and do the uh, roll-ups uh, and then the aggregate it and then compute your result when you get the query. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, of course, sometimes going to be very slow, especially if you have like a lot of point lookup queries, uh, then you probably don't want to be in that uh, side of the spectrum when you want to do low latency user-facing analytics. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where you have, uh, you can just pre-compute everything. Uh, this is typically what key value stores do, which is pre-compute. Mm -hmm. Keep the result ready for every possible combination. But then there's two problems with this. Uh, you've lost uh, flexibility because every time there's a new dimension or there's some new data, you have to make sure that it's pre computed. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to use that. Mm -hmm. And then also, just pre computing everything is uh, going to result in space explosion. Mm. So start re-index is the solution to this because it lets you pick exactly which columns matter to you and pre-aggregate only those. Mm. Uh, pick exactly which aggregation functions matter to you and compute only those. So mm -hmm. you could say that, uh, oh, in my data set, only the dimensions country, browser, and device. These are the ones that I will do point look lookup queries on. So I'm only going to pre-aggregate these. I only care about some of this metric, say some of impressions. Uh, and then you can also specify that uh, at any point, I want to make sure that uh, the query doesn't have to pre do aggregations on more than say 10,000 records. Okay. So with this, you are exactly able to control the amount of or time that it's going to spend in pre-computation right. versus what's already there. Mm. And then you can choose to be wherever you want on the spectrum of no pre-computations to pre-compute everything and then Got choose it. it based on your space and latency trade-off requirements. Very interesting. And how, where's the predicate handled in the star tree index? Uh, so, so think of it as uh, if you have, say, in the example that we did, uh, country browser device. So we're going to start with like the star node. And then let's say we uh, do pre-computations for like a few countries. And then I we see, see that there's only 10,000 records left. So you might start with US and Canada and India, China. And then you know that, oh, now this is my uh, star node. So 
Got it. Then you go next. So you have like kind of countries. So if you have a query like uh, select something from uh, US, a country equal to US, then it's going to traverse the tree. Uh, it will say, oh, in US, and now I'm going to see the next browser so and so. Or if you don't have browser column, then you'll go to the star node under US and then pick the uh, columns under those. So Got it. And then pre-compute those, pre those, those values, those, those aggregations. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it. Um, yeah, it sounds super, super powerful. And I've seen it. I've seen the, the benchmarks on some of those queries and they're very, very fast, uh, especially I'm sure when they're tuned well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, well, I know there's a couple other um, features that you've uh, introduced. Um, do you want to talk to us about upserts and um, join support and a couple other key things? Oh, yes, definitely. So uh, upserts was one of the most impressive features added to Pino in the recent few years. Uh, so this feature is where when you get an event, uh, you insert it if it doesn't exist, update it if it does exist. So this was uh, spearheaded by another uh, interesting use case that uh, Uber Engineering was trying to solve. And this it really stretched the boundaries of what uh, Pino can do. So the use case they were trying to solve was uh, something like uh, a fair update that happens after a trip is over. So you maybe add a tip or some toll gets added. So your fare is now different. Mm -hmm. Or let's say in uh, retail, I've seen the use case where there's this order and the state of the order keeps changing. Uh, so you're okay. going to get new events. but Makes you, sense. But while for some applications, you might just be concerned with the latest event or the latest state, or you might have some special logic that, hey, if I have several events with this primary key, I want to do something and compute like a better value for it and not just go with all the values. So this was basically the upset feature. And because of this, Pino has now uh, shifted from immutable data store to supporting mutability. Mm. And this is like a game changer for OLAP systems, uh, which so far used to be mutable. Uh, sorry, so far used to be immutable. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing many people in the community doing uh, very interesting things with this feature. Awesome. Um, and what about joins? I think you've made some change, some changes to the join, um, the, the, the query uh, engine uh, on the join side. Yes. Uh, so in fact, just today, we have published a blog about uh, joins in Apache Pino. Ah. Uh, yes, this is a very recent feature. It's still in an early release branch. Uh, so, I mean, I remember two years ago when Kishore came on uh, Data Council Thursday as mm -hmm. well. Uh, I remember him mentioning that oh, we've consciously stayed away from joins so far. Uh, it's like a uh, design choice. This is kind of, uh, we don't want to do this for low latency queries. And we have like a presto connector ecosystem with which we can, uh, uh, so you can do the joins if you have presto and then kind mm -hmm. of. Uh, and then uh, we keep kept hearing from users that Hey, we really love Pino and we want it to be the single store. Uh, and also just having everything natively in uh, Pino is uh, nice. And uh, it it's uh, so kind of these two reasons motivated us to get to adding join support. And uh, this, we had to make some interesting changes to the architecture of Pino to support this. So uh, earlier on, when I explained the broker layer and the server layer, it was pretty much the single stage scatter gather uh, for the longest time. That's how it used to be. And this is fine for analytical queries like say filter and then aggregate. And then uh, when you send everything back to the broker, it has to do like limited merging of results. But then when you get to multi-stage queries like joins, uh, this poses some limitations because data sets often won't be co-located. 
So after like initial filtering on all the servers, if you send everything back to the brokers directly before any aggregations, you might have to do some data shuffling and then some local join and then mm. the final aggregation mm. and uh, a single stage uh, merge phase is going to easily become like this bottleneck. So to support this, we have added uh, multi-stage query execution support. And uh, there's like a lot more details about how this is done uh, in the blog that was published today. And the cool thing is this not only unlocks joins, but also gives us the ability to uh, add other complex multi-stage operations, like say window functions. Mm. So yeah, wow. this, is, this is one of that's the new a, and upcoming that, features that we are very excited about. That's a big update for sure. Um, we'll make sure and, and share that blog post with our community and and get it out via social um, so that people are aware of, of those changes. But that sounds especially significant. Congrats on that Thank feature. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, uh, Neha, it's been it's been so great chatting with you. Um, we're out of time, but I wanted to ask you where can the community reach out to you and find you if they have other questions about Pino. Uh, so definitely the Pino Slack channel. Uh, that's the fastest and easiest way to find me, uh, and also. You can find me on Twitter at Neha Pawar18. Okay, Neha Pawar18. Um, sounds great. Well, thanks for joining us, Neha. It was great to chat with you and, and hear about your enthusiasm and, and all of your commits uh, on the Pinot Project. Same here. It was great chatting with you, Pete. Thank you. Awesome. And to our listeners, thanks for joining. Um, we'll have more DC Thursdays coming up. And don't forget that you can check out all of our DC Thursday previous conversations on our playlist on YouTube. Um, you can also see all the, all the talks from our recent Data Council Austin on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so uh, stay tuned 